All right, welcome everybody. I'm going to uh, wait a couple more minutes to just see if there's any uh, last couple people who arrived. Um, my name's Alex McLean, and in the absence of Hugh, who is on uh, vacation, I think, um, I'm going to be uh, hosting the session tonight. It's one of my jobs as a vice chair of the, uh, of the society. Um, but I'll just wait a few more minutes and then I'll get on to introducing our speaker. can also take this uh, uh, minute to invite you if you um, are attending this lecture and enjoy it and you are not yet a member of the Society for Church Archaeology to have a look at our website and see if you're interested in joining because um, there are uh, other things that we do uh, and a journal that we uh, produce and things like that which may be of interest to you. So um, please do have a look. All right, I think we'll get going now as it seems there have been a few more joiners, but um, not too many. So it is my great pleasure uh, today to introduce John Wand, um, who is our guest speaker tonight. He's a longtime member of the society for uh, over a decade now, and he's um, well known as an independent scholar uh, working primarily on parish churches. Uh, and today he's going to talk to us about a churches fit for their people, a study of 11th and 12th century English parish churches. Um, he says it's uh, primarily focused around Wiltshire, but will be ranging uh, widely to uh, lots of places covered by the Doomsday Book. So I will now uh, mute myself and hand over to John so he can share his screen and present his lecture. Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this lecture. Um, as you see, that's the title of my talk. And this gives a summary of what the talk's going to cover. I'll talk about the background to what I'm doing and why, cover my methodology, and then present some uh, analysis that's the heart of the work and discussion of the results. They sort of intermingle, which is why they come together, and there'll be a summary at the end. Um, starting with the definition of parish, just to remind people of what it is. A parish, as it says here, is a self-contained and self-sufficient unit of ecclesiastical administration and pastoral care based upon the resident priest and associated church. That's from John Blair's Church in Anglo-Saxon Society, but there are other definitions which are available. Um, just to bring out the fact that you're talking about geographical areas of parish, you have a priest, you have a church, you have a congregation, these are all related but independent entities. Um, the parish system in England uh, evolved between the 10th and 11th centuries, uh, that's generally agreed. It didn't happen all at once, of course, but sp spread slowly across the country uh, and paralleled what was happening in the continent at the same time in this country taking over from the uh, Minster system. And alongside the parish formation, you see a, what's called the Great Rebuilding, where parish churches and churches were built or rebuilt in stone over this period. Um, and what you see is that there's a quite a wide range in this size of the churches, particularly their naves, which is where the congregation would have uh, been based. And 
the, may, the normal reason that this is uh, felt to have happened is because it's the need of the church to accommodate all the, parish all the parishioners. Um, so everyone was expected to attend church for at least one or two services a year and you needed to provide accommodation to uh, look after them all. Um, this at a time when there was only one recognized religion, the Catholic Church, and where there was considerable pressure socially and uh, re religiously to, for people to attend church. Um, can this be tested? Um, what you need is something that will, will tell you about the population of uh, at parish level. And it so happens that England is unique in having the Doomsday Book, which provides this information at the level of detail required. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is how does the population of Doomsday Book relate to the size of uh, Nor Norman parish churches. Um, I use the term Norman, that's the historical period, which really relates to roughly 1060 to 1200. And it also relates to a particular form of architecture, which I'll come on to. Now, this sort of analysis has been done before. Um, Lindsay Proudfoot in 1983 looked at uh, churches in Warwickshire across the medieval period to see uh, whether you could relate church size to population and found that there was a reasonable relationship, although that was a fairly broad brush approach. But James Bond, the real James Bond, not the uh, fictional spy, uh, was inspired by this to do a study of churches in Worcestershire. And I think the results were not particularly conclusive because I don't think James employed a statistical uh, analysis of them. But nevertheless, he was teaching on the course that I was on, which was a part-time course in archaeology at degree level at Bristol University. And he inspired me to see if I could have a bash at this. Um, so I decided to look at Wiltshire in the first instance. Uh, why Wiltshire? It's a large county. Um, one of the things one wants to do with these sorts of studies is to minimize the number of variables. So for Wiltshire, the boundaries of the county are largely unchanged. So places that were in Wiltshire in 1086 are still more or less in Wiltshire today. It was covered by a single diocese, the uh, Salisbury Diocese. It was one of the wealthiest parish uh, counties in Doomsday, uh, which might have inspired a fair amount of church building. Uh, it was unscathed as a county by the events of 1066, so there was no harrying of Wiltshire as there was in Yorkshire and uh, other areas in northern England. So you wouldn't expect those sorts of events to have uh, affected things. There's reasonable documentary coverage of the county and most importantly, a good number of Norman parish churches, which are uh, on the basis of the study, of course. Um, Turning to methodology, the Doomsday Book, uh, commissioned in 1085 by William the Conqueror in Gloucester and produced in 1086. There's general agreement that the book was produced by uh, seven circuits of commissioners, each circuit covering a number of different counties. Uh, how do you know that there are seven circuits? Because there are slight differences between the information provided by the commissioners. Although it's thought that each of the commissions set off with a standard set of questions, the uh, responses that they fed back to the central point where they're all collated do show differences. And moreover, there are differences between counties within one circuit. So again, that's one reason for looking at a particular county to make sure that you're not uh, getting odd information coming in from the way the information is collected across different counties. Coming back to the Doomsday Book, Norm, the northern counties, Cumberland, Westmoreland, Durham, Northumberland, were not covered by Doomsday, so this analysis wouldn't uh, cover the, those counties uh, at all. Um, you also find that towns are somewhat problematic in Doomsday. It doesn't always give their populations, and when it does, you can't distinguish uh, between the parishes that might have uh, occupied the town. But that's not really a problem because Partly because you find that in most towns, the number of Norman churches is very small. They've been um, rebuilt or damaged over the centuries. So there's not many uh, churches that I would categorize as Norman in towns. 
and moreover, you find that 90% of the population was living uh, on manors in, in the rural countryside and they were working on the, the agricultural base. So one's going to get, be able to cover 90% of the population through this uh, study in any case. Doomsday works by manors, not by parishes. So you have to convert from manors to parishes at some point in this process. And it also lists heads of households or counts numbers of heads of households. Uh, over the years, historians have argued about how to multiply from heads of households to total population. Is it a factor of three, four, five? Um, I don't need to worry about this for my analysis, as you'll see later on. Uh, and here's an example of the Doomsday Book. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see the entry as it is on the folio. This is for Minor in Wiltshire, not to be confused with Mildenhall in Suffolk. Um, those of you who might watch uh, Time Team might remember the uh, episode where they dug at Cunetio, which is the uh, Romano British uh, small town, which is uh, next to Minor, or Minor is next to Cunetio, depending on how you put it. And the uh, local lad, Phil Harding, uh, always referred it to it as Minor, uh, which was somewhat confused Tony Robinson at the time. Um, the above is the uh, extract put out in fairly modern English. You can see that it's fairly terse and abbreviated, but does give you the numbers of uh, smallholders and villages, and also some other information as well, in particular the value of the uh, manor as it was in uh, 1066, and it is now 1086, 18 pounds, which is an annual figure. Uh, and here's Minel Church in its full glory. Um, the plan shows in heavy black, the uh, extent of the Norman church. And for my purposes, I want to have at least one, two, three, preferably four corners of the nave as identifiably Norman, which enables me to work out the area of the nave. Um, anything more is an added bonus, and this is a fairly uh, well-preserved church, although the windows are obviously being added later. Um, how do you go about dating parish churches? This is done on the basis of archi architectural style. Um, and you can, if you're lucky, work out differentiation between Saxo-Norman or early Norman, roughly 1050 to 1100, uh, also called the uh, Saxo-Norman overlap. Norman, if you can't do, distinguish terribly well, 1060 to tw about 1200, and late Norman based on changes in style from 1150 to about 1200. And the sort of things you're looking for are shown here, the Norman doorway at Ogborn St Andrew, the Norman Arcade, all these wonderful chevron, chevrons and very heavy uh, abstract or geometric uh, ornamentation, which are characteristic of the period of Romanesque architecture at the time. And as I say, enables you to date the church or parts of it. How do you go about measuring the churches once you've decided you have a Norman parish church? Um, there are three main sources of information on this. Uh, there's the literature. Um, if you look across the country, then in particular, the Victoria County history, particularly that produced prior to the Second World War and the volumes from the Royal Commission of, of his historic monuments in England give uh, detailed plans and dimensions for parish churches. So they're a real boon in this uh, exercise. Then there's other forms of literature as, as well, in particular um, studies from uh, county archeological magazines or journals and uh, a number of other sources. If literature fails, then you can go on to faculties. Faculties are essentially the um, church equivalent of building regulation plans um, produced when people were wanting to amend or restore churches in order to get permission from the bishop or his uh, delegate to uh, carry out that work. You can come across faculties in county archives. And I've visited a number of them to do so. But also in the 19th century, the Incorporated Church Building Society was very active. As its name suggests, it was uh, designed to provide funds to help with these re restorations and renovations. 
And those plans are available online, but if you want to, you can visit them in person at Lambeth Palace Library up in London. And uh, sometimes you need to do that because the plan as it's presented just says, the scale is one eighth an inch equals uh, one foot, but it doesn't tell you how big the uh, plan actually is when you see it online. So you actually have to go and see it in person to work that out. And if that fails, then site visits are uh, what one does. Um, but also site visits are useful to check up on uh, the dating and uh, any oddities about the church might have risen either from the literature or the faculties. And it's a, a good, good reason for going out and exploring the countryside and uh, visiting places you've never been to before. Um, now this is a bit you've probably been dreading, statistics part of the methodology. Um, this is will be deployed as you'll see to uh, work out whether we're actually getting any relationship between the area of the church and the part, doomsday population. And the appropriate statistical test is the Spearman rank correlation, which as it says here is a measure of the statistical dependence between the rankings of two variables. So in our case, uh, just to make it a bit more uh, concrete, does the church with the uh, highest, does the parish with the highest population also have the church with that largest nave area? Does the parish with the second highest population have the church with the second hard, highest uh, nave area and so on, forth down the list? Um, you can carry out a series of mathematical operations to generate a Spearman rank correlation coefficient. And I won't uh, go through all the mathematics involved and spare you the, the pain of all that. But the uh, Spearman rank correlation coefficient ends up with a figure between one and zero. If you've got a figure of one for your uh, data set, then that's a perfect correlation. If you've got a correlation coefficient of zero, then absolutely no correlation whatsoever. Um, in practice, in the real world, you're never going to get to one. It's how close to one do you get uh, it determines whether you've got some form of correlation or not, which you can look up uh, in tables once you've got your uh, correlation coefficient. Uh, and generally they work in three categories. One is no correlation, the second is some correlation, and the third is highly significant correlation, which means that there is a less than 1% chance that you've got a random set of uh, variables rather than a correlation. Uh, and, or if you want to turn it around, it's the 99% chance that you've got a real correlation there between uh, population and nave area. So what does this actually look like in practice? So this is my analysis for uh, Norman churches in Wiltshire. Along the x-axis at the bottom, we've got the doomsday population of the parish as given by the numbers of heads of household. And up the side, you've got the nave area of the uh, parish church. And you've got a set of dots, which are all the uh, data points in the data set. And the computer's happily drawn a line through them all. Um, but is this a real line or is this just a random scatter of dots? This is where you need the uh, statistical test to show whether or not you do have a correlation. The other figures on this graph describe the, uh, on this graph describe the uh, shape and gradient of the line, which we'll come back to. But do we get a correlation? Yes, we get a very highly significant correlation at the 1% level, which is the highest degree of correlation you can get from the uh, data sets. Um, so that's you know, very encouraging. A um, couple of caveats with how I've developed that data and that uh, rank correlation coefficient. Uh, first of all, any um, parish where the doomsday population was less than five, I've ruled out because on the basis I suspect there's something wrong with the doomsday data. Um, so we don't want to put that in to confuse the system. And secondly, I found that um, because you're converting from the doomsday data on manors to parishes, you have to include in the data all the manors in the pa in a given parish. Um, so in Wiltshire, which is slightly unusual, there are quite a few parishes where there's more than one doomsday book manor. Um,
And this is, you have to ordinate survey maps to look at fairly modern parish boundaries to see where Doomsday Brook Manors were located. Um, if you just take the manor in which the parish church is, you don't get a good correlation. What you find is you have to use all the uh, doomsday population in all the manors that come into the parish. Um, conversely, if you find that you've got uh, one parish covering two, uh, two manors, sorry, let's get this right. If you've got uh, a manor which straddles two parishes, such as the uh, Bishop of Winchester's Downton Estate, then you can't include those in the analysis because of uh, other complicating factors which come in. Um, so those are the caveats for the you know, study. So next question is, is this just applying to Norman churches or does it apply to all churches uh, in the county? Um, is this uh, specific to the Norman period or not? So uh, there are a couple of tests I applied. Again, Wiltshire was useful because there are quite a number of Anglo-Saxon churches surviving. Uh, so I looked at Anglo-Saxon churches. You can again get their uh, doomsday population. Uh, is there a correlation? No. And at the bottom of the table, you can see early English churches. That's the uh, churches built in the 13th century, immediately after the period I'm interested in. And again, one doesn't get a correlation. So it does only apply to Norman churches. Uh, and the next test was just to look at uh, a couple of counties which had already been studied, Warwickshire and Worcestershire, the uh, Proudfoot and the James Bond studies respectively. And those cases for the Norman churches in those counties, one did get a correlation. So this is showing that it's not just a, a luck of the draw that Norman churches in Wiltshire shows correlation, it's uh, more widespread than that. And since then I've expanded it to look at a number of other counties, 18 in all listed here, um, helped by the fact that a number of these counties have been com comprehensively covered either by Victoria County history or by the Royal Commission. Uh, but uh, also I've made a number of visits to across these counties. So when you tot it all up, that's 18 counties covered, total of 615 churches and eight dioceses. And you find that in each of the counties, about 30% of the Doomsday population is uh, covered by the churches in the analysis. So you're getting quite a widespread coverage and a widespread result coming out of this, uh, which I would suggest is more than just a, a random chance. For counties which aren't on that list, I haven't visited them yet. It's not, they don't, have a correlation, it's just that I haven't been able to test them as yet. Uh, and for the northern counties, because Doomsday doesn't cover them, uh, I'll never be able to do that. Uh, and a couple of other counties, there's either not sufficient Doomsday information or sufficient churches, Cornwall and Cheshire come to mind. Again, one isn't going to be able to cover those with this sort of analysis. Um, having done that, you can try and think about other questions. One of the uh, issues which arises in this sort of area is what do aisles do? Aisles tend to appear later in the period from about 1150 onwards. And there's been considerable discussion as to what was the purpose of these aisles. Were they built, added to churches in order to uh, cater for an increasing population across the period? Or were they for other purposes? Uh, if you look at them uh, in individual churches, then they're all pretty narrow, so four foot, metre and a half wide, something like that. So not really designed, it's argued, to uh, cater for people, but more for processional routes. Um, what can we do with this study? Well, this table shows results for looking at aisleless churches, churches that, without aisles. Um, not that many in Wiltshire, unusually. Uh, in other counties, it's quite a large portion of Norman churches which are without aisles. Um, one can look at all Norman churches, that's the whole data set of 54 churches, and you get a significant result for naves and for, church, for naves plus aisles, because I think 
when you look in a little more detail, looking at early Norman churches and later Norman churches, whilst you do get a correlation for the earlier churches, that is with aisles added uh, to ch Norman churches built up to about 1100, you do get a correlation. When you add the area of the aisles, the ch Norman churches built from 1150 to 1200, and those aisles built in the same period, you don't get a correlation. Um, so I would suggest that the correlation only really applies to aisle-less churches, churches without aisles, and that implies that uh, aisles were not used to in, provide additional space for congregations, but for other purposes, probably for processional purposes. And I've looked at uh, other counties, Worcestershire is the uh, example given here, churches without aisles, you do get a correlation when you add in churches with aisles, the total area of nave plus aisles, you don't get a correlation. So I think again, this shows that churches with aisles, the aisles were built for purposes other than accommodating an increasing population. Um, more maths, I'm afraid. Turning back to the uh, graphical display and the line and the mathematical formula that describes the line, you get a line with a gradient. That gradient gives you the area per head of household, uh, which in Wiltshire's case works out about nine to 10 square feet or just under one square meter for a household which might be three or four people, which seems reasonably uh, reliable. Uh, and more interestingly, perhaps, you've got B, this intercept on the y-axis. Does this mean that in, in parishes where there's no population, you still had a church with an A of some size? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that. Uh, what it means is that it's the space that was used for other things than house the congregation. Um, the font and the altar, perhaps. And when you look at the value for B, you get an answer of three to 400 square feet, uh, or 28 to 36 square meters, which again is probably not unreasonable. Um, so this diagram shows what I'm talking about for B. If you, this is uh, based on All Saints, Sutton Bingham in Somerset, which is a Norman parish church. And if you put in the, a font, this is just a hypothetical font um, chosen to illustrate the case and an altar. Certainly in the early part of this period, the altar was uh, thought to be in the far end of the nave and over the period slowly migrated into the chancel arch and through the chancel up to the east end. But for this early period, I've shown it here, red, is the area that the congregation would have been able to occupy. The white areas are the bits which are fenced off, figuratively speaking, for the font or the altar. So it gives you the idea of what this factor B is about. It's about describing this area of white. Um, so continue to the discussion. Having established there is a correlation between nave area and doomsday population of a parish. What is the cause of this? Correlation does not necessarily imply causation. If you think about the relationship between the sales of ice creams and hot weather, doesn't mean that ice creams create hot weather. Um, so one has to think about various causal factors to see whether they might be affecting this relationship rather than, as has been proposed, the religious reason to house the entire population of the parish. So possible factors are wealth, prestige, social factors, and last, religious. Uh, so I'll cover wealth in some detail. Um, wealth comes in two parts for this purpose. There's annual income, which is what's given in the Doomsday Book. And if you think about the income coming into a parish on an annual basis that might cover the maintenance and running costs of the church but it would not in general provide the funds needed to actually pay for the building in the first place that's where capital comes in um, well, in this period you don't know where that came from generally 
but it would have been provided to cover the cost of the building. Um, one can look at the relationship between wealth and uh, population in a parish as well. Uh, and this shows that there is a high degree of correlation between um, population size, uh, sorry, uh, between nave area size and wealth. Uh, and there's also a high degree of correlation between population size and wealth in terms of annual income. In fact, the degree of correlation between wealth and population size is better than that nave area. Uh, when you think about it in a bit more detail, this is a rural population we're talking about, agriculturally based, and at this period it was all done by hand. So the more pairs of hands you've got to uh, cover the fields, the greater an area you can cover, the greater the area you cover, the more wealth you can generate. So that's, I would argue, the reason why you've got a very strong relationship between population size and wealth. Um, Interestingly, during this analysis, one can look at uh, early Norman churches uh, versus later Norman churches, and you tend to find that parishes with early Norman churches, that's churches built up to about 1100, tend to be wealthier, I have a higher annual income, than churches built later in the period than parishes uh, with the, those churches. And if you look at Anglo-Saxon churches, the parishes with Anglo-Saxon churches are even wealthier in terms of annual income than those with early Norman churches. So is there an effect going on here um, which might merit further study? But having put annual income to one side, one can then think about capital. Um, the sources of capital aren't generally known for this period. You can make guesses, but uh, it's probably that there was a range of different sources from in different parishes, whether it was the uh, par parishioners gathering together, whether it was a few leading parishioners, whether it was the uh, owner of the manor, or whether it was the owner of the advowson, the uh, church itself, which might have been a different person or institution. Um, it's probably a range of those. Um, anyway, they stump up the money uh, and one builds a church. Now, if you think about building a church, you've stump, stumped up lots of money. What are you going to do if you build, if you have more money than you need to build a church the size required to house the population of, of the parish? When I was doing my uh, degree, the argument was that in general, when you had excess wealth, you built the biggest thing possible to show off your wealth. So think about, um, Tudor mansions or uh, Georgian country houses, built as big as possible, as much as you could afford in order to display your wealth. I don't think it's applied in uh, the case of Norman Parish churches. And I uh, would I advocate the, uh, what I've called the Ferrari model. This is based on what happened in the UK when we were given our pension freedoms, the ability to spend our pension pots uh, more, more freely than previously. And there was great fear at the time that everyone would go out and buy the flashiest uh, sports car you could afford, a Ferrari or an Aston Martin or whatever. Not the biggest car you can afford, but flashiest. And I think the same thing applies to Norman Parish churches, that when you had more wealth than you needed to pay for the uh, right size building, you didn't pay for a bigger building, which would have been a white elephant to your descendants, but you paid for bling. So what's the 11th and 12th century equivalent of bling in a parish church context? It's sculpture, uh, which comes back to this dating, of course. So this is Ditteridge, which is a relatively small parish church in Wiltshire, but which has some of the best and most ornate sculpture in the county. You can see just about this uh, lyre shaped sculpture around the arch and these two uh, capitals of the uh, imposts. Um, and if you look at the population for Ditteridge and compare that to its uh, nave area, then it fits very well with the correlation. If you look at Ifley, which is perhaps better known, Ifley Church in Oxfordshire, you find that the area of the nave 
that parish church correlates very well with uh, the, the doomsday population. But it, Italy is much better known for its uh, sculpture than it is for its size. So again, it's an example of where the person who was paying for the uh, building had excess wealth and was able to spend it on uh, sculpture to make the building look more ornate and attractive or blinging it up as the common modern phrase is. Now, if you're a bit bedazzled by all this mathematics, a uh, bit of light relief. Um, if you look at Dittridge, uh, then you've got on the uh, imposts on the left and right of the entrance, two uh, figures, two, scar two carvings. On the left, it's clearly a dragon, actually a wyvern because of the curly tail. On the right, the figure is much less clear. And if you look at the literature, it's called a lion, a dragon, a horse in different sources. The uh, listing describes it as an animal and Pevsner calls it a quadruped. So if you want to uh, think about what is this actual sculpture? What is this figure? Any guesses, any thoughts? Is it a lion? Is it a horse? Probably not a dragon. Uh, answers on a postcard or in the box, chat box. Um, so to conclude, I think there is, I have established that there's a correlation between the doomsday population of the parish and the nave area of the uh, Norman church for our list churches. That's I've found across 18 counties. So I, I think it's certainly a, a real phenomenon. I would suggest the cause is religious. It was done so that all parishioners could attend at least some of the church services as required. How was it actually uh, enforced? I think this was done because in order for a church to become fully uh, functional, it had to be consecrated. And the person doing the consecration was the uh, bishop of the uh, area of the diocese concerned. So you could see the bishop turning up and if he didn't meet what is required, i.e. that the church was fit for its purpose, he would refuse to consecrate it. So I think there was that level of control coming down from, in the case of the 18 counties, eight bishops. So it's a fairly small number of people that are doing a force enforcing this uh, correlation. Um, so I think that's yeah. would, would be the way in which this was uh, required rather than uh, coming bottom up from uh, all 600 odd churches. And you can think about ways in which one might uh, extend this uh, analysis. Is it a way of estimating populations in areas where you don't have doomsday count? Are you reversing it? You've got a church with a given nave area. Can you uh, effectively use a formula to work out the population of that parish from the size of the church, which might be of interest to those looking at uh, the northern counties in England where you don't have the doomsday record? Um, so it's just a, a thought to think to leave you with. And last but not least, a few of the key references. If you want to look up some of the other references, uh, then this article was published in Journal of Church Archaeology some years ago, and that will give you all the references. So that uh, concludes my talk. All right, thank you very much, John. Um, so hopefully uh, there will be some uh, questions coming to Rob in the chat. Um, so, sorry, I was talking without my video on. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so if you have any questions for John, please do uh, put them in the chat. While we're waiting uh, for some of those to come, I can uh, start us off. Um, so, uh, thank you very much, John. It's super uh, interesting. I wondered if you could expand a little bit on why you think this is particularly, why there's no correlation in the late Anglo-Saxon period or, you know, when you get to sort of the 13th century, but there is for the Normans. Is this sort of a concerted period of, thinking about, you know, provision for, for the parish or is there something else going on? I th well, I think um, certainly for the 13th century churches, it's a fact of um, changing population. Given that Doomsday was written in 1086, you're three or four generations beyond that, which would have allowed for quite an increase in population, at least according to uh, people who study this. So I think what you're finding is that the 13th century churches 
followed the same principle of being built to accommodate the population, but the population have grown significantly since the doomsday record of 1086, which is why you don't get that correlation. Um, Anglo-Saxon churches were probably starting to come into the parish system at the time. Um, some may have had other origins, but again, you're working away from you know, your three or four generations before the doomsday record. So you have a, a smaller population to think about if those churches were built to give you the uh, fit for the con congregation. So again, that's, I think, why you don't get that correlation. Okay. Um, are you are you looking at only churches that are completely built at, you know, in the, you know, up to 1100, up to 1200, as opposed to sort of taking churches that may have the same footprint of a pre-conquest church, and then they're expanding on it? Or how are you kind of distinguishing between your, your phases? Um, I'm looking for churches where you've got the evidence that at least those four corners or three corners of the nave are Norman fabric. Okay. Um, so the other bits might have gone, but at least you've got confidence that what you're seeing at the corners is the actual area of the uh, Norman church. Mm. So I, yeah, I do wonder for your early English stuff too, where by the 13th century, at least in my, what I'm used to in Yorkshire now, it may be very different, but you're starting to see a lot more accretion come the 13th and 14th centuries as opposed to complete rebuild of the nave. So you keep in the corners the same a lot of times from your Norman yeah. nave. Um, and then you're just adding bigger aisles or, you know, things like that. That's right. You see the aisles starting to come in. Um, and as you say, bigger aisles, which might actually have accommodated the population uh, mm -hmm. rather than being just for processional purposes. Um, so, yes, you can quite often find that the heart of the church, the basic nave is, is Norman. But as you say, with these accretions built on, on, on the side. Um, but if you can see the Norman fabric, that's good enough for me. But yeah. if, if the church is completely rebuilt, then I wouldn't uh, count include that in my data set. Okay, right. Um, any other questions from the crowd? Yeah, I've got one question and one that's just popped in. So I'll read the second one, but I'll start with the first one. Uh, so John, you suggest that it may be possible to reverse the data that you shared. Um, for example, estimate the population size by the size of the church. Mm. Could you also use this to indicate dates that churches were constructed if this could not be figured out from the architecture? That's a question from Jonathan. Uh, yes, you can start to do that. You have to be a bit careful how you do that. Um, and towards the end of the period, if you're getting to sort of 1180, 1200, some churches you find don't fit the correlation terribly well. Um, so uh, one case in point is Lugershaw in Wiltshire, which ha has a very long nave, is very plain, and is far bigger than the doomsday population would imply. And I think what's going on there is that someone has decided to uh, build a new settlement, and they're building the church to fit their hope for plans for that settlement around about 1200. Um, so they're seeing a vast increase in population compared to what would have been a fairly small settlement in the 1080s. So that, if you like, is working the other way around. You're picking out anomalies in the data and trying to explain the anomalies rather than using it to uh, work out the size of the church that might have been on the ground. Hey, yeah, thank you for that. And one other question here from Francis is, do you think it is possible that the lack of correlation in Anglo-Saxon churches might be because it wasn't standard at, because uh, it wasn't as standard to expect the entire population to attend services and perhaps lesser control over standard liturgical practice at the parish level? Yes, that's certainly uh, one possibility. I think then you have to think about what was the origins of the Anglo-Saxon churches, which are probably many and varied. Were they originally minster churches? Were they proprietorial churches, i.e. churches built by the owner of the manor for his own purposes? Uh, and probably in those cases, you wouldn't get a correlation. But if the Anglo-Saxon church then became a parish church, which is what I'm picking up, 
then you would have expected it to have been modified in, in the norm period in order to accommodate uh, the population, which I think is why you're seeing some of this correlation for Anglo early Norman churches with aisles being added to accommodate that population. So it, it, it's a complicated picture there. Nothing is ever easy in this life. <laughs> No, that's very true. Well, thank you, John. Thank you. That's uh, all the questions we've got so far. Um, but we've probably got time for a couple more if anyone can throw one in last minute. But for now, I'll hand back to Alex, who I have to unmute. So there I go. Yeah, sorry, I muted myself because I could hear my kids shouting up the stairs. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought rather than have that in the background. Um, okay, great. Uh, well, thank you very much, John, uh, for uh, providing uh, this lecture, really stimulating stuff. Um, and um, for anybody out there in the audience as well, we are still, um, you can still attend our annual conference this year, I think in the next week or so, um, if you want to sign up. So that's in Liverpool uh, from the 16th and to the 17th of September, uh, and it's on churches in the Northwest. So if that sounds of interest to you, do go by our website and check out how you can sign up. Right. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Rob, for uh, your technical expertise. And I think you can uh, sign us all off now. Okay.